Greetings and welcome to Invest in Children's 2020 annual meeting, our very first virtual meeting, and we certainly hope it will be our last. If you're like me, one of the best parts of our annual meeting is seeing 400 other people in the same room who care as deeply as you do about Invest in Children and early childhood issues. And it's always great to have a chance to catch up and say hi, and we know you're still out there. Um, we miss seeing your faces and we hope to be together again next year. Generally, my remarks um, are about our prior year accomplishments. Um, today, I wanna focus on our response to the world in which we are currently living during this pandemic and in the aftermath of the brutal murder of George Floyd, which has once again laid bare systemic racism in a way that was so personal and disturbing that it is truly changing our world. While in the past I might not have felt the need to say so explicitly, we at Invest in Children feel that I do need to say, I condemn that act, we condemn that act and all that it represents. Invest in Children is devoted to exactly the opposite of this horrendous tragedy, social justice and valuing every human life. We believe that Black Lives Matter right from the very beginning of that life. This truly feels like a watershed moment and I want to share our response. Invest in Children was created 21 years ago by civic leaders so that every child in our community could reach their full potential. With our programs and advocacy, we have sought to level the playing field and eliminate racial disparities, beginning with infant mortality and continuing through to kindergarten readiness. But over the past year, we have realized we need to be more explicit in our purpose. And therefore, several months ago, we revised our mission statement to call out equity and eliminating disparities. Words matter. We're now working on the further actions we need to take to make good on our mission statement. And we plan to examine our work in new ways. And we will report back in that, on that over the course of this year. And we hope celebrate some accomplishments together at next year's meeting. We will hold ourselves accountable and we ask you to hold us accountable as well. Actions matter. We also realize that at this historical moment, when there is a heightened awareness among the general population of the depth and breadth of systemic racism in this country, there is no better time for all of us in the early childhood field to lift up our work and communicate the importance of what we do. We have called out the impact of racism by highlighting the statistics showing the disparities in mortality and poisoning. We have talked about what we're doing to correct these disparities and the others that exist. We need to be louder and stronger in our messaging. Therefore, Invest in Children will also be working in new ways on communicating. And you'll see that campaign roll out over the next uh, year as well. As we know, if you keep doing things in the same way, even while meaning things, you get the same results. We feel called to this moment to use both our words and our actions in new and more effective ways to fulfill Invest in Children's mission in pursuing equity and eliminating racial disparities. We ask that you join with us in words and actions and advocacy in that pursuit. And as we know, all of these events are happening with the backdrop of the global pandemic, which has forced our early childhood system to function in ways we never imagined in order to continue to serve children and families. It has been truly amazing to watch each program transform to the extent possible into providing home visiting and early childhood mental health and early childhood education services virtually. We are bending without <laughs> The pandemic also brought into stark relief racial disparities, both in the health outcomes for African Americans affected by the virus, as well as the digital divide and the ability to access virtual services. However, I want to lift up some stories of resilience 
by both service providers and the families they serve. I'll start by talking about SPARC, Supporting Partnerships to Assure Ready Kids. Um, it's a program implemented by our lead agency, Family Connections. Here's a story from Clarence Baker, the SPARC parent partner who works with families in Slavic Village. Um, and so from Clarence, um, here's the story. SPARC families have adjusted to the changes forced upon us all. Many of the families have minimal means when it comes to technology. And this often leaves families with only the use of a single prepaid phone with limited data. Together, we figured out how to provide the best experience given this challenge. For example, one family visits their close relative who does have Wi-Fi and an iPad on a weekly basis, and we schedule our FaceTime session each week at that time to keep up with the lessons. Both child and parent now learn together using day-to-day -day life as the classroom. Virtual interactions can be challenging, but this family has found a way to not only continue to learn, but they found better ways to learn. In the time that the stay-at-home order has been in place, the child has gone from not knowing all letters in the alphabet to actually reading words. Bright Beginnings is our lead agency for the Parents as Teachers Home Visiting Program. Several years ago, we created a Facebook group for the families in PAT, what we've called Parents Connect. It's facilitated by Frashik Austin. During the pandemic, we enlarged the group and we included families from our other home visiting programs, Moms First and Spark. Frashik has shared some stories of how families are connecting and supporting each other in this special Facebook group during the pandemic. And so here's some, here's some stories from Frashik. Even while working through this crisis, parents are trying to maintain a sense of normalcy for their children. One of our moms asked for help with letter recognition from her child. Another swooped in right away and pointed her in the direction of a website that she can use to get her child on track. She told her how often she uses the website and the results she experienced with her child. Another mom was looking for support while her infant son was going into surgery. Other families in the group immediately responded, offering support, prayers, and positive thoughts. Finally, one of our families celebrated her son's kindergarten graduation, and the group congratulated her and celebrated her son's achievement. When we started this group, of course, we never imagined how it would become even more important um, during a pandemic when families have been so isolated. Um, we're really grateful that we've been able to provide um, this vehicle um, for families to connect and support each other. And of course, uh, for Sheik, our leader, provides support as well. Um, actually, uh, the Parents as Teachers National Office has, uh, was aware of the model even before the pandemic and um, is, is very impressed in how we uh, have added to the Parents as Teachers curriculum in this way. The other components of our system has also, have also found new virtual ways to support families. Our Early Childhood Mental Health Program has continued to provide clinical services virtually, and though most of our UPK sites have been closed over the past couple of months, they continue to send out Ready Rosie videos of parent-child activities, provide activities for children online, and responding to the digital divide, provided learning packets that parents could pick up and do at home with their kids. A special shout out to our five UPK programs who became pandemic care providers serving the children of essential workers, and also to Starting Point, our lead agency for early care and education. Um, they pivoted to support all of the pandemic providers in our community. Um, you saw in the title slide a picture um, of some of the children of essential workers that were at our um, UPK uh, pandemic site fundamentals, holding, proudly holding up signs, telling you what, what their mommies or daddies are doing um, to help in the pandemic. As the child care system reopens, Invest in Children worked with our County Emergency Ops Center um, and were able to provide UPK sites with a free package of PPE um, to assist them with getting uh, ready to open, which was extremely appreciated. Uh, something we never imagined we'd be doing, uh, but we were happy to do it. Finally, um, uh, the staff of uh, the County Board of Health's Newborn Home Visit Program 
um, has been working tirelessly, unfortunately not on the newborn home visiting program, but they have been um, called into action um, with the entire staff of the Board of Health to address the pandemic and been working very long days um, on contact tracing and other activities um, to help us all get through this. So as I come to a close now, I do wanna recognize the amazing work of the Invest in Children team who have adjusted to our remote work without missing a beat to support our service provider early childhood system. They each bring not only their expertise, but their heartfelt commitment to the work that we do every single day. And they are Bob Stabe, Marcos Cortez, Kiana Tidmore, Dan Moss, Alyssa Swiatek, Shauna Rohrman, Sonia Hickman Coleman, Mary Delaney, Shauna Dewey, Loretta Amanor, who is our public service fellow this year, and um, John Ladd, who is our uh, Zoom host and the man behind the logo today, and who uh, provides all technical expertise for the meeting. So thank you to everybody. So now I want to turn to um, the highlight of our meeting, which will be our keynote speakers. We're really delighted today to have not one, but four speakers to provide our keynote presentation. They're all leaders in state government um, working um, in, on early childhood issues and will be providing us with an update from their perspectives on the early childhood programs in their department. And we're gonna start with Dr. Valerie Alloy. And at this moment, I'm gonna ask her to um, unmute uh, herself and uh, show us uh, the video as we uh, proceed um, so I can introduce her. First presenter today is Dr. Valerie Alloy. Dr. Alloy is the lead Early Childhood Mental Health Initiatives Bureau of Child and Families, Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. She's a behavioral health policy administrator, educator, researcher, and practitioner with over 30 years of clinical practice and senior management experience. She oversees the whole child matters. This is the nation's largest investment in early childhood mental health and an initiative that has garnered much national attention. Prior to joining Ohio Moss, she served in the Department of Youth Services as a member of the psychology department, working with the most violent and dangerous youth offenders. Dr. Alloy has a doctorate in clinical psychology, is a licensed supervising clinician, passionate agent of change, and a champion for youth, families, and lifelong learning. Dr. Alloy. Well, welcome and thank you so much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to join the Invest in Children group today as we celebrate many accomplishments that have happened in the past and set our path for the future. Uh, in preparing for our talk today, uh, Dr. Dorman asked us to address a few specific areas. And uh, in so doing, I want to say that you echoed in your introduction many of the strategies and activities that the Early Childhood Mental Health Workforce have been implementing around the state and particularly in your area. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and perhaps not speak to and repeat some of the individual programmatic activities and strategies, but perhaps pull our lens out a little bit more broadly and speak to some of the more um, uh, overall strategies and supports that we can do now and going forward. Probably the first question that's on everyone's mind is what are we looking at for funding? And at this time, we do not have any clear guidance on what our fiscal year 21 funding levels will look like. Uh, we are all just at a, a lovely patient pause in hopes that areas that are around critical mental health and behavioral health services will stay at their current levels, but we do not have any definitive information at this time. So um, it's a little uncomfortable for all of us, but we have to just stay optimistic and firm in our understanding that critical behavioral health and mental health services is a priority area of our governor, this administration, and all of our respective agencies and programs. Um, so during the COVID-19 crisis, um, the early childhood mental health field pivoted into many strategies, as uh, Dr. Dorman talked about, that were non-face-to-face -to, -face to enhance our personal safety uh, and care uh, during the pandemic. Primarily, our work um, centered into three main areas. Uh, our consultants provided family support, 
uh, through all kinds of telehealth and virtual mechanisms. We provided support for children um, who were struggling with challenging behaviors and frustration and the, and the disruption that the COVID-19 crisis uh, brought all of us. And we also pivoted to providing behavioral health and mental health support to our early learning professionals and our um, staff, right? Both behavioral health and early learning professional staff. And those um, supports took a variety of formats. One of the things that I was really proud of was um, work we did to stand up tips and strategies to help parents navigate the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we did that uh, as a department. And then we collaborated with groups like Ohio Groundworks to build that out into a toolkit. And that'll be part of the resources that will be available uh, as, as a part of your annual meeting. So the virtual toolkit uh, talked through um, 10 different ways that we think it's important for adults to support children and so adults to support their own mental health uh, during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. We also then partnered with sister agencies uh, as we pivoted into COVID, uh, in the middle of COVID, kind of where we are now and the pivot out, to make sure that those types of strategies are still available. Things like team huddles. Um, Dr. Dorman talked about the need for actual resources like PPE, but also the need to stay connected and to build really clear understandings of what we're going through in this shared experience and how we can take that shared experience and pivot out of it in the most resilient manner possible. Uh, the department has sponsored many trauma-based trainings, uh, particularly all switched to virtual formats that increase the capacity of the state of Ohio to have trainers train the trainers in trauma-based um, best practices for families and children. Um, resources again on how to still enroll in some of those will come at the end of the, um, uh, of the presentation. And we also had many other trainings switching into virtual modalities. All of these things to build our understanding of this shared pandemic experience, what to expect on a psychological and social emotional level, and then what strategies we can do to really ground ourselves into resiliency, not just for ourselves as adults in the experience, but also how our children are co-regulators with us and how we then can set forth a, a, a type of resilient response uh, for our young people. Um, other things that we've done in addition to communicating on the national level with our, our, our peers around these strategies, we've actually done um, uh, webinars with our state agency partners as we pivot out of COVID-19. Um, we particularly did a uh, webinar uh, with our sister uh, Job and Family Services Agency to help our um, child care workers and early learning workers uh, know how to do self-care strategies. Uh, COVID-19 has brought to bear an important understanding that our mental health is just as important as our physical health and that we need to pause and take care of it. And so what I'm hopeful for is that as we move through this experience, that we are able to retain some of the opportunities that this event gave us, that we can transition those forward. These um, staying connected opportunities are very, very critical. Um, the ability for us to be mindful and to take this time that we have to pause and do our own social and emotional and psychological regulation teaching those mindfulness uh, um, strategies to our children and sharing those. All of those are things that we're hoping that we pivot out of COVID, still appreciating uh, and engaging in. I'd like to take a moment or two and address the most recent overlay, as Dr. Dorman said, um, the awakening that our communities and nation is having uh, as a result of the um, overuse of force and the death of Mr. Um, George. Uh, Mr. Floyd. What we know right now is, is that we are all looking at a moment through a similar set of lenses, but with different focus on those lenses. I was very um, comforted by the Invest in Children's statement that words matter, but actions matter more. And that's exactly where we are. I also want to draw attention to that the attention to the fact that the children coming back into our early learning settings all of our children are probably going to be asking questions and needing assurances to understand this extra um, trauma that our nation is experiencing. I just want to take a moment to ask you all to, to do some specific work around that. We have to do our own work, our individual level work. 
Um, for those of you that have joined us over the past two or three years, we, um, the department has been pushing the understanding of cultural and linguistic competency and implicit and explicit bias into core competencies in our early learning space. That work is important now more than ever um, so that we understand that some of the behaviors and reactions that we see in our young children are based out of this historical trauma and that local context. And then right now, these areas are going to be heightened so that we need to enter that space with even more sensitivity and understanding of, of our ability to support um, this type of systemic uh, response that we're going to have and that we're going to need. So I just wanted to take a moment and punctuate that and then uh, ask Dr. Dorman if she had any follow-up questions. Thank you so much. Um, well, never has uh, trauma-informed training been more important, and it feels like there's been, um, maybe for the first time, a worldwide experience of trauma together. Um, adults, well, and kids, people of all ages, and I, I think the point that you made that we have to do some work ourselves um, uh, dealing with all that we've experienced, the multiple traumas, um, is really crucial. And we all come to this moment uh, with different lived experiences, um, but we all have to pause and reflect. Uh, and especially as we deal with, as you said, what children, um, children's questions, which are likely to come, we need to be prepared um, and we need to take care of ourselves. I think your, your message could not be more timely and um, we understand uh, the, the importance of, of taking the time uh, to do the work internally um, as we do the work externally. So uh, thank you so much. And any final words before we, uh, we move on? Or, um, yeah, I'm anxious to share with our peers what else is happening at the state level. But thank you Great. so much for inviting us. Okay, thank you very much. And next, we're going to ask um, Dr. Wendy Grove. There you are. Hello. And, um, and it's great to see you. It's so great to see faces. Uh, so I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Grove. She's the director of the Office of Early Learning and School Readiness at the Ohio Department of Education, where she helps develop and implement policies for preschool special ed and early childhood education. She oversees a team who's responsible for licensing Ohio's public preschool programs and other early childhood special ed programs. Daily efforts include creating resources for early childhood professionals working to align Ohio's mixed delivery early care and education system, and that's a mouthful, and ensuring the ethical and responsible use of data for informing policy. Uh, Wendy loves data and uses data. Uh, prior to joining ODE in 2014, um, she spent eight years overseeing Help Me Grow in Early Intervention at ODH, and by training, she is a sociologist. So Wendy, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for the invitation to participate today. We're really eager to share some updates with you all and uh, acknowledging how you have supported children and families across Cuyahoga County during this pandemic, of course, always, but particularly now. And so the Department of Education recently published new reopening letter from myself and it is I will include the link to that letter to make sure that you have it but following our colleagues in child care uh, the Department of Education had to pass um, a set of rules in order to allow our preschool and school age child care programs to reopen there is a K-12 school building closure order that it is that is in place through June 30th. But because of uh, executive order by Governor DeWine, an amended order, a new order from the Director of Health, as well as our State Board of Education passing emergency rules, school age child care, as well as preschool settings licensed by the Department of Education are now exempt from that school building closure order effective June 9th. So you can open, 
and we are working very diligently on some guidance, anything that can be helpful. We're answering questions every day. So if you have questions, the end of that letter gets you directly to our team of licensing specialists. And I would definitely encourage you to make that call if you have a question about the new, um, the new rules around health and safety. We did align our emergency rules exactly with ODJFS, Job and Family Services. So it really shouldn't feel or look any different if you are across multiple sites that are uh, licensed by the different entities. So at the same time, and this is just coincidence, the rules for school age childcare and preschool are up for five-year rule review. The two have sort of nothing to do with each other, but those chapters, which are 3301-37 and 3301-32, are on the website for public comment. We have gone through and made improvement changes, things that are necessary due to alignment um, to meet or exceed the rules uh, that are out for JFS childcare. And then also just to come into compliance with things like the child care development block grant, to update language, and to really try to truly simplify and clarify some of the language. So those two chapters of rules are up for public comment. I wanted to make sure that you were aware and that you had the opportunity. Again, I will include the link in the resources at the end of the presentation so that you can go in, take a look at what we're proposing and, and provide public comment. Um, uh, and we do take positive comments too. So positive or negative, we welcome them all. Uh, they are up for comment through uh, July 1. And so some other um, information that I think you're probably wondering about or are aware of is that last year, the rule um, for children with disabilities, preschool children with disabilities, uh, was adopted by the State Board of Education, but it is not yet enacted. And I've had a lot of questions about this because people are wondering if we will be enacting this rule um, as they are planning for the fall and the upcoming year. And, and the answer to that is no. It still has several steps to go through, and it is not the Department of Education's desire or hope to implement a new set of rules or regulations during a school year. So more to come on that, more communication around that particular rule as it moves through the uh, legislative process. But um, uh, key questions around what do you need to think about? What do you need to uh, consider in identifying who, which children may come back to buildings uh, in the fall or even maybe you're considering a summer program? Summer programming in preschool and school-age childcare in ODE licensed uh, programs is possible. There are no obstacles to that from the state rules standpoint or, or regulations. Um, we are trying to help and provide guidance around just those health and safety measures that are in place due to the due to the health orders around the pandemic. But we really do want to be supportive. And as you are trying to support your community and the families and the children uh, who may not have seen their teachers or been with their teachers for several months now, uh, we are seeing a lot of creative thinking and outside the box uh, and how they are engaging each other. And we're excited to see that. And we hope to see more of that as time goes on through the summer. But there is no obstacle to reopening now as far as the legislative or the state, state level um, information. CARES Act funding will be coming to school districts soon. And this is a, a money much like that you receive under ESSA or the Every Student Succeeds Act. And there will be guidance that accompanies that funding. And as people in your position and who are working with these, uh, our youngest citizens every day, uh, the money is 
possible to use for early childhood programming. So there are not restrictions around the age group. And so if you have a voice or uh, to take that message forward, um, we would certainly uh, encourage that. And so with that, we have uh, wanted to mention one or two other things that are coming. The kindergarten readiness assessment usually happens in the fall. Currently, there is no um, plans to do anything different. We don't yet know what school will look like in the fall, and we all acknowledge that. So, but today, expecting that as kindergartners come back to school, uh, we would have the teachers do the kindergarten readiness assessment R or KRA revised. And this is a significantly shorter version of the same tool. And we worked for about 18 months with an advisory group. We heard you teachers. We heard it took too long. It was at a critical point in the beginning of the year. And so now this is a 27 item measure. The items are those that you'll be familiar with and that you'll recognize. And so those kits are being delivered actually as we speak across the state to all of the public school districts. And there is virtual online self tutorial, uh, as well as hybrid models of training for this. It's not a mandate to be retrained if you have already been trained. So I wanted to make sure that you heard that message from me. Your new kindergarten teachers will have to be trained, but we significantly shorten the training and it is now 100% virtually available. Another um, piece of information for that is, again, if you do the early learning assessment in your programming, we are right now, today, planning for that to happen in the same fall window as before. As you know, the spring window was canceled. And so as we learn more and as we move through these summer months, these messages may change. This is a fluid situation. So I do want to be uh, tell you what I know today and tell you that we will continue communicating around all of our programming. And that includes our uh, you know, partnership with the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services and Mental Health and Health, as well as colleagues at the Devel Developmental Disabilities and Medicaid. And so with that, I will return it back to Rebecca. Do you have any questions? You're muted. Sorry, I did the, uh, thought I'd unmuted. So that was jam packed <laughs> with so much information. So I just want to make sure uh, we, people know that we're going to put, you know, the resources that both you've referred to and Dr. Alloy referred to, there will be sort of a resource guide almost to the presentation. So folks will know that along with, um, with the link, with the person to call, the number to call, I think, if people do have questions. And it, as you said, it's, a, it's an evolving situation and, uh, and everyone's just has to sort of go, go with the flow. As the as the saying goes, which is really which is really hard, um, and um, I guess especially around um, the KRA, um, my question was: assuming that we do get KRA data, um, do you think we can use it to learn something about the impact of the pandemic and um, learning loss, or what? Just any of your thoughts on that? Rebecca, you and I, Patiko, I am actually very eager to have some data and, and I'm hopeful that it will happen statewide because I do think that there is a lot of important analysis that we could do to really give a, a picture to what this pandemic looked like for these children who were in their school and rising kindergarten time. And it would be really fascinating to know if they were in having a virtual, like, well, you know, how often were they connecting with either their peers or their teachers if they were in, uh, um, or if they were in a pandemic childcare uh, program once those were open. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I mean, I, I'm hopeful. I would love to be able to look at those data in multiple analytic ways. And so we are planning to do that. And at today, assuming we will have statewide KRA completion, we'll be able to do a lot of in that mm -hmm. way. Um, you know, that's our hope. Okay. Anything special um, that's being planned to help kindergarten teachers welcome children, um, some of whom, you know, are, of course, there are always kids who have never had a group setting, but now pretty much all kids or many of many more kids are coming in. Um, anything special the department's planning to help with that? So in our restart guide, we'll have specific, um, uh, we actually engaged around 40 early educators, so our preschool and kindergarten uh, colleagues around the state and ask them to tell us what they need. And after participating in a focus group with us, and this was just about uh, two weeks ago, we got a lot of not only tips, but a lot of uh, identified um, help us with this, guidance questions. And so we are actually structuring our entire restart guidance around what they told us they needed. And some of the best part of what we are going to include there is from the teachers themselves their ideas. Everybody is out there thinking about what is this going to look like. We have the parents wondering what it's going to look like for their children. We have the teachers wondering what are the options, what could we possibly do, administrators who are considering alter alternative schedules and smaller class sizes and how long are we going to do this, that, or the other. And so yes, we are uh, we've heard all kinds of fun ideas already for the kindergarten registration side of things. Drive-by, stop-ins, dis socially distanced. Um, it, it's been really funny to hear all kinds of uh, the creativity that is around the state. And so we will be including a lot of these great uh, tips and ideas that have come from the teachers themselves. So look to that. It should be out okay. fairly soon. Okay, well, thank you very much and uh, appreciate it. And I will allow you to mute and unvideo. And um, next, I'm going to introduce Diane Gogan Turner, who is the Chief of the Bureau of Maternal, Child, and Family Health at the Ohio Department of Health. Uh, she serves as the Ohio Title V Maternal and Child Health. Uh, Block Grant Director. Diane's experience in public health programs spans over 24 years with almost 20 years of management experience. She worked with the SNAP program um, and WIC and um, at both the local and state level for approximately 10 years and most recently at the Ohio um, WIC uh, as Ohio WIC program director as well as the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant programming um, as well as Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant programming for 11 years. Sorry about that. Uh, Diane is a registered licensed dietitian and international board certified lactation consultant. And so now I will be delighted to welcome uh, Diane. Thank you and I apologize. My desktop does not have video. Um, I wanna thank everyone for the work that you do every day. The events of the past several weeks have been painful and I want to acknowledge that. Personally, I'm still processing everything that has happened on top of the coronavirus pandemic crisis we're all struggling with. Social determinants of health such as housing, transportation, and employment are important predictors of health and racism is a crisis that requires our attention. Implicit bias is pervasive and impacts health while manifesting itself in disparate health outcomes. We see every day firsthand the disparities in health outcomes and environmental conditions experienced by African-American women, children, and families in our state. I know we all work every day to make our programs more available to the most vulnerable Ohioans and to develop public health policies to address the environmental conditions and social determinants that negatively impact population health. So I wanted to start with the announcement of the posting of the Ohio Department of Health Chief Health Opportunity Advisor position. So please visit careersohio.gov and, and share the posting among your networks. We would appreciate that. 
Again, I'm representing the Department of Health and our Bureau. Programs in our Bureau include the Title V Maternal and Child Health Block Grant, Maternal and Child Health Related Data and Surveillance, Home Visiting, Infant Mortality, including the Ohio Equity Institute, Maternal Morbidity and Mortality, School, Early Childhood and Adolescent Health, the Children with Medical Handicaps Program, Oral Health, Reproductive Health, WIC and Breastfeeding, Genetics and Sickle Cell, Newborn Screening, including Hearing Screening, Asthma, and Save Our Sight. So I want to start with an update about our Title V program. We've completed a needs assessment process and we are convening population domain groups for the next grant application process in the five-year plan that begins October 1st. We are sharing our needs assessment results and the Title V indicators that align with the identified priorities. And we'll be asking stakeholders to help tell the story of maternal and child health work in our state. And then over the next year, identify potential new strategies for this five-year cycle. It is one of our priorities to address health equity throughout all strategies. I wanna provide some updates from our surveillance section. This section includes um, programs such as child fatality review, fetal infant mortality review, pregnancy associated mortality review, the youth risk behavioral survey, as well as the, the two surveillance systems I'm going to mention um, in this update. So in April, 2020, the CDC released a pregnancy module to the COVID-19 case report form that is comprised of a pregnant case form and a neonate form. We are modifying our Ohio disease reporting system for COVID to capture all fields within the pregnancy module and create files to export to the CDC platform. The implementation of this activity will require coordination between our Bureau and our Bureau of Infectious Disease. And the data collection includes identifying pregnant cases within the existing surveillance system following patients identifying birth or fetal death certificates within their state's vital record system, contacting clinicians for additional information and abstracting relative, relevant information. We will perform a retrospective data linkage using the Ohio Disease Reporting System and the vital statistics data, including birth and death certificates. First, we'll be evaluating the quality of the data submitted and then using this linkage to examine outcomes of pregnancy with confirmed COVID infection. Our EPI staff will determine if there are significant differences based on trimester of infection, pre-existing conditions of the mother, mother's age, as well as race and ethnicity. In an effort to leverage our current maternal and child health related surveillance systems to collect additional data on COVID-19 and how it's impacting Ohio's maternal and child health population. We've added COVID questions to two surveys that we co-sponsor with the Ohio Department of Medicaid. One is the Ohio Pregnancy Assessment Survey or OPAS, which is a statewide ongoing targeted population-based survey that uses the CDC's methodology for the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System, or PRAMS. So PRAMS and OPAS data have been collected continually in Ohio since 1999. The Ohio Study of Associated Risks of Stillbirth, or Ohio SOARS, is a new statewide population-based survey initiated in 2020, and it's designed to collect information on maternal experiences and behaviors before, during, and after pregnancy among women who experienced the stillbirth in Ohio. So SOARS will provide critical, timely population-based data to better understand the risk of stillbirth and measure progress towards goals in reducing stillbirth. The questionnaire collects data not available, and other, and other means like medical records or death certificates, such as life experiences before and during pregnancy, social support and stress, services and medical tests offered in hospitals after stillborn delivery, substance abuse and grief and bereavement support. So earlier this year, this calendar year, we amended the OPAS and the SOARS questionnaires to add supplemental questions and the data collection has begun. General comments about current COVID status in our Bureau and Bureau programs. We are heavily federally funded, so we have been able to manage the state fiscal year 2020 state budget reductions. 
We don't have state fiscal year 2021 final funding amounts, but we are planning minimal impacts to the service delivery provisions by our Bureau programs. We have had staff pulled in primary COVID-19 efforts including um, Alyssa Leatherman, who's the administrator of our home visiting and infant mortality programs, is pulled full-time, um, helping to lead the state emergency operations center. We also have staff at call centers, providing EPI support, recovery guidance, and strike teams. And then others that have to take on the additional workload of those who are working in the primary effort roles. Our programs quickly transition to teleworking and televisits will continue at least through June 30th, 2020. We are working with sister state agencies and our bureau programs to develop guidance for the return to face-to-face -face interactions, um, home visiting specifically. So for home visiting, televisits are being implemented and families are maintaining their involvement with our four models, Healthy Families America, Nurse Family Partnership, Parents as Teachers, and Moms and Babies First. We also provided family retention funds that could be used for diapers and wipes, as well as phone card minutes and data. There was also funding attached to submitting implementation plans, and then funding was received for the infant mental health credential rollout at the same time, but not specifically related to COVID. Our home visiting team has hosted regional conversations with providers as an outlet to share ideas and challenges and barriers. We received many questions about resuming home visits and many comments regarding how much more engaged families have been with virtual visits. And we'll use this information to develop recommendations for the future. For example, continuing incentives that may be at lower amounts and continuing to allow for telehealth visits. Home visiting trends continue to be that overall our referrals are steady, our acceptance rates are up, the exit rate is slower than normal, and um, more home visits are occurring uh, as televisits. While we exceed last year's number, we are likely not to hit our expansion goal this year, but considering all that's occurred lately, we are pleased with this progress. We are coming down the home stretch with our maternal infant and early childhood home visiting needs assessment and appreciate the work to date with partners. The needs assessment is intended to be used not only by the Department of Health, but any of the state agencies or other agencies contributing to building the system of home visiting in our state and the provision of local services. Our final product should be ready by October and we will share. I also wanted to provide an update from our early childhood health team. The, the demand for online independent study courses, which are free and provide Ohio approved credit, is ex escalated due um, to uh, the COVID crisis and so more, more courses are offered and we open up, up weekly, um, so they're happening more frequent, frequently. We'd like to acknowledge the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, who is a member of our Ohio Healthy Programs Council. It, it's a stakeholder group that reviews our Ohio Healthy Program materials, contributes to the content, and helps make decisions about the Ohio Healthy Program. The Cuyahoga Board of, of Health is currently piloting our our new Ohio Early Care and Education, Nutrition, and Physical Activity Assessment, and we really appreciate the partnership. And of course, if we're talking about early childhood as a former WIC program director, I have, I have to share that WIC is open for business, um, and please continue to refer to the WIC program. WIC is also, um, the strength of the WIC program is also the referrals that WIC provides to other important programs that um, families need. And WIC visits continue as well as virtual as much as possible um, with benefit cards being loaded with very low or minimal contact. I will wrap up my updates with questions in advance. So thank you, thank you for your questions. The first question was how are programs under our purview addressing significant inequities with children of color face, that, they, that they face in Ohio? So home visiting is working to address infant mortality and disparities in our infant mortality rate with ongoing trainings and, and conferences. Um, in fact, uh, implicit bias was uh, recently trained and has con continued to be offered through our bureau. There's also an advisory group working across state systems to help inform policy that addresses disparities in infant mortality. And our, our home visiting framework is designed to address inequities and disparities. If programming is implemented as intended, the target population is families most in need of services, which include children 
who may be part of ethnic or racial minority groups. The second question was about the Governor's Advisory Committee on Home Visitation and recommendations from March of 2019 to eliminate health disparities. Race and ethnicity are critical components of our services and home visiting services. At the time the recommendations were made, race and ethnicity were not being adequately acknowledged or addressed. With the change of administration, Ohio Department of Health is once again acknowledging that there are racial differences in health due to systematic racism that must be specifically targeted in order for racial disparities in health to be eliminated. We've also expanded eligibility for the Moms and Babies First program, which serves pregnant African American women. This ensures more African American women are eligible to be served. The next question was related to current events and events of the past few months related to trauma informed care. And the framework of home visiting, especially Healthy Families America, is trauma informed. Healthy Families America has been hosting monthly to weekly webinars on the topic of the current crisis and how families may be affected. Home visitors for all programs and uh, program models complete ACES training through Ohio Train. And the last home visiting related question was also related to the Governor's Advisory Committee recommendations to allow children up to the age of three to enroll in home visiting. Home visiting rules have not changed yet. Our eligibility criteria are consistent with the evidence-based models we implement. Our two prominent models, Nurse Family Partnership and Healthy Families America, require prenatal or early birth enrollment. But we are exploring the possibility of expanding our partnership with parents as teachers, which would allow some expansion of eligibility criteria. I will wrap up with the final question, which was related to the lead poisoning uh, program. And so while not part of our bureau, the Ohio Department of Health lead poisoning prevention program is a friend of the bureau. There's no safe level of lead in a child's blood and any blood lead level is an indication that a child has had some exposure to this powerful neurotoxin toxin, and efforts should be made to prevent future exposures. The CDC no longer uses the term quote unquote level of concern as any level of lead in a child's blood is evidence of exposure and should be concerning. The issue of childhood lead poisoning was brought to the forefront of public health when it was recognized and funded by the Maternal and Child Health Law Grant 10 years before the establishment of the CDC funding. Ohio has made significant strides in reducing the number and severity of children's lead exposure in the state but lead exposure continues to be the number one environmental threat to children in Ohio. ODH follows the official guidance document developed by one of our medical advisors, Dr. Cynthia Shellhouse. The CDC changed the name of their childhood lead poisoning prevention program to the, to the lead poisoning prevention program to address all risk groups. The Medicaid funding that the Department of Health receives can be spent on children less than 19 years of age, but also pregnant women as well. So we would be interested in refocusing efforts to ensure at-risk women are tested and receive anticipatory guidance. And the LED program is open to discussing as needed. So please feel free, if you think of questions later, you have my contact information to reach out if questions about our bureau program or the LED poisoning prevention program, and I can connect you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Diane. I have one, um, one follow-up question uh, for you, and that is, I think it's something that's on everyone's mind. Um, it, what is going to change um, in the future? What have we learned from doing uh, remote or virtual work? And so if I apply that to home visiting, do you think it's, you said that, you know, we're gonna stay virtual through the end of June and then, you know, we'll see what happens um, after that. But do you see that there might be an option in the future, even after in-person visits are allowed, that for some families, uh, virtual visits may work better? Is there any discussion about a more sort of a flexible choice of how the home visit happens? Yes, absolutely. We are looking um, for that for the future for home visiting and our other programs as well. Okay, great. Well, we'll, we'll all stay tuned again. Another uh, action-packed, information-filled presentation, and we'll uh, look forward to uh, sharing any resources and links that you can uh, provide to um, everybody out there so they can uh, 
can access those uh, later. So thank you very much. And now I'm going to say last, but definitely not least, there's Kara. And it will be my pleasure to introduce Kara. Um, Kara Wendy began her career, or her work, sorry, not her career, her work services in April of 2019. In this role, she oversees child support, children's services, child care, cash, and food assistance. Um, just a small job. Prior to this position, Wendy was the deputy director over the Office of Family Assistance for six years, and before that, she served as the Office of Family Assistance Program Administrator and the section chief over the cash and food assistance policy areas. Um, Kara started her career with the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services in 2004 in the Office of Legislation. And uh, Kara, thank you so much. And we're looking forward to hearing all of your updates. Thanks, Rebecca. So I wanna uh, start by just saying, um, if you're not tired from hearing all the work from my colleagues, um, you should be because it has been a fast and furious last 13 weeks, I think on all fronts. When I hear them talk about all the work they've accomplished, and I think about what my team has done, you know, I don't typically think people think of state government as an agile, you know, uh, entity. And I think we've been able to prove that we can we can make change fairly quickly over the last 13 weeks. And we, I think, are focused on two words, at least at JFS right now, and it's really around resiliency and agility. How can we help with the information and the knowledge and resources we have today? And how can we make decisions so we can continue to move forward? And I think the other piece that we are trying to keep in the forefront is really we're making the best decisions we can, but we are committed to continue to evaluate those decisions and adjust where need be. So I'm gonna give you a couple of updates based on what we've done in the past, what we see coming, and then I do wanna throw in a couple of additional program updates, not just over um, the childcare space, but also uh, a, a few tidbits around children's services and then uh, food security that we've been uh, dealing with over the last few months. So in the child care space, I have to start with a big thank you. Um, our child care providers, the families that depend on us, they have just been incredibly patient and they have worked with us to make these changes work, um, even when we knew they weren't ideal. But we all went into this with the, the, the first concern being the safety and the health and well-being of our professionals and the families we serve. And I know that those have not been easy changes or easy um, accommodations to make, but people, you all have just risen to the occasion time and time again. So as you guys freshly recall, at the end of March, we had to close our regular license and stand up pandemic programs. Those pandemic childcare programs, some of them were brand new and stood up in several days with uh, some pretty rigorous regulations that they still had to adhere to. And we successfully stood up more than 2,400 programs. Those programs served our essential staff, um, their essential staff's children. And on any day, they probably had just over 24,000 children in their care. We can't thank those professionals and those own business owners enough for ensuring that our essential staff had a safe place for those children to go during that time. We know that it was a heck of an adjustment and just really appreciate the commitment that everyone made to putting that, those children's safety first. I'm happy to report that we are in our second week of reopening. As you heard Dr. Grove say a few minutes ago, we um, at ODGFS have aligned with the Department of Education around some new transitional regulations in the childcare space. Um, under the pandemic programs, we did have a very strict one to six ratio, except in the infant room where it was one to four or two to six. So one teacher to every four, our four infants. Um, when we moved into the reopening and the kind of the transitional provisions, we actually were able to increase that a bit in our preschool and school age rooms. So instead of the one to six ratio, we're now at one to nine. We have maintained the increased hand washing. We have the notification process. If someone has been exposed or test positive, not just to um, JFS through the serious incident reports, but also through notification of the local health department. 
And we've been able to maintain the 21 pandemic days. So without getting too into the technical side of things, I did want to mention that those 21 days of payment are still available if you have a positive test result and the local health department tells a the business they have to close. Obviously, in all of these conversations, whether it was with the governor's office and the administration or with parents, we have health and safety as the first concern and then access and capacity as a second. Um, we need to make sure that parents still have parental choice where possible and that there are safe environments for these kids to go so we can restart Ohio's economy. I think the one thing that's just been incredibly clear in all of these conversations is the critical role that early child care, early childhood plays in not only the educational component, but also ensuring that Ohio has a really strong economy as we um, move back into reopening. As we continue to move forward, we are looking at um, a lot of questions around compliance that we receive every day in the childcare space around the, the, the new rules and what does professional development look like and how is step up to quality going to change. As you know, in the step up to quality space, we are still committed to, to quality and we have not changed that perception at all. We did have to put that on hold a little bit when we transitioned to pandemic programs, and we were fortunate that the Ohio General Assembly supported us in delaying that July 1 date to now September 1st. I'm also excited to announce that in March, prior to COVID, we actually had 91% of all programs serving or providing publicly funded childcare participating in Step Up to Quality. That is certainly no small feat, and um, we know that that's through the commitment of programs and, and the support of Invest, in Ch uh, Invest for Children and Free for CLE and all of the great supports that we have in Cuyahoga County. I also want to just talk a little bit about capacity. So when we started to look at reopening, we knew that one of the primary concerns was going to be that reduced ratio. And one of the items that we know we need to commit to continue evaluating is what is the appropriate class size. One of the things you're going to see ODGFS partnering on with um, a, a public university is a study that will look at the spread and prevalence of COVID-19 in a congregate care setting. Now, this is going to be an informational study. We, as you all likely know, put out a survey to our providers to ask questions around what are your biggest concerns and what policies do you think need changed? We also asked at the end if programs would be interested in participating in a study that would actually um, do the nasal COVID-19 swab and then track those programs to see how COVID-19, if it spread, if it, if it looked different in a congregate setting, because there just wasn't a tremendous amount of research out there. We know several of you have likely participated in the Yale University study, which we appreciate you uh, providing uh, your information and taking your time out to do that. We also hope that in the, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to select um, programs to participate in this Ohio specific study that will continue to inform us around how we need to evolve. As you heard Dr. Grove say earlier, we still aren't sure what K-12 is going to look like in the fall, but we know that childcare is going to have to um, be flexible and adjust accordingly because we know that that could create a capacity issue as well. So know that that is in the forefront of conversations, that we are focused on trying to make the right decision to balance health safety but also capacity, and that we have that commitment from the top down. I also want to just mention the uh, grants that were recently put out. So if you are a program that's in transition and haven't decided kind of where you're at, um, we put out our pandemic grants. Our, there's two types. There's actually a COVID-19 grant, and then there, if you're a center, there's also a ratio support grant. When the governor announced reopening, we were very fortunate that he also announced a $60 million commitment to standing up grants to support programs during this time of these reduced ratios and also new costs that no one could have anticipated because of COVID-19. So if you want more information on that, as Rebecca said earlier, we're going to put out a resource page that is on the JFS website. And there are those two components for family child care, in-home aids, day camps, there's the COVID-19 payment, which will help support uh, the need for supplies. So if you need masks and gloves and Ziploc bags and all the things that we need these days to ensure our safety um, and our health, 
we can help you purchase through those those grants and then an additional payment can be um, received if you're a, a center and you could be eligible for ratio support as a result of those reduced class sizes that is the the grant payment for june um, in the next few weeks we are going to continue to look at what those payments look like how many programs we have open and see what they're what we can afford essentially for july we want to make sure that as we receive the cares funding the cares act funding um, the commitment is to make sure that we're investing that into those programs additionally i you've heard me mention capacity and access i'm excited that we put out a um, a field in our licensing system and we asked our child care providers to notify us because we opened up all of our regular license we wanted to make sure that if they were opening, we had the date that they were going to open and kind of their plans as we move forward so we can continue to gauge that access. Um, as of the beginning of this week, we had 92% of our programs respond in our licensing system, it, whether they were going to reopen or not. And as of July, according to the information we've received from providers, 71% of our programs plan to reopen. 91% of our programs plan to reopen between now and December. Obviously, a majority of those programs are going to open in June, uh, another large number in um, July, and then the rest will kind of trickle in primarily in the fall. And then we had a couple of outliers that said they wouldn't likely open until the new year, just because of safety and ensuring professionals that they could have, uh, they had enough professionals to be on site. So, we are continuing to monitor. We are continuing to hear from the field, which we appreciate. We have put together a best practice toolkit to answer questions and to try to provide some new practice ideas to keep our, our children and professionals safe that you can find on, on that website. Uh, and I just wanna give a quick shout out to the two focus groups and the strike force team that helped inform some of these decisions along the way. Um, none of them were taken lightly and none of them are easy. I think the one thing we heard in every conversation is it just doesn't feel like there's a right answer. It feels like we can make the best decision we can with the information we have. And then we need to continue to move forward and try to adjust as more information comes in. So with that, I wanna shift a little bit and give a quick update into our children's service space. Um, as many of you likely have heard through the media, we are, are um, very fortunate to have partnered with Dr. Grove and others at the Department of Education in the children's service space. In the first two weeks of K-12 closure, we saw a reduction of almost 50% in our children's service referrals. Clearly during a time of more stress and more time with parent-child interaction during that stress, we don't believe that child abuse and neglect actually reduced. Unfortunately, those kids just weren't being seen by those mentors and teachers, and librarians and coaches, and those referrals weren't coming in at the same pace. So we partnered with our friends at the Department of Education, and we were able to get out additional information to the school districts, the superintendents, the school psychologist association, and have just experienced an overwhelming support in this space to try to ensure all of our children are safe. I'm happy to report that although we are not close to where we want to be, we did see that number um, drop. It, instead of being closer to 50%, we're closer to 35, 36%. So that work is paying off, but we still have a, a big gap to fill. And we know that the reopening of our child care programs will also assist in that space. The last concern that I will just mention before I uh, turn it back over to Rebecca is in, in food insecurity or food security, depending on which way you're looking at it. One of the um, primary focuses also at ODGFS is ensuring that children and families have food um, in that safety net to live by. And when K-12 closed and child care programs closed, we knew that families that were at times really dependent on those sources to get breakfast and lunch weren't there. Schools did a fantastic job of trying to get the free and reduced price meal lunches out to families, but sometimes they just couldn't get there. Um, at ODGFS, again, we partnered with the Department of Education and stood up the Federal Allowable Program, PEBT. And um, that means that 
children that were eligible for free and reduced lunch in March and April will actually receive a card if they weren't already receiving SNAP benefits um, in the amount of either $234 or $302, depending on when they became eligible, to purchase food as a result of being out of school March, April, and May. Through that program, more than $250 million is going to go out to support more than 850,000 families that had their lives kind of flipped upside down when that K-12 uh, school closed and we went to remote learning and they may not have had access to that food. So if those, in, those families um, were on SNAP, we actually already issued their benefit to their card. Um, that happened a couple weeks ago. And if they weren't already on SNAP, um, they will actually get a new card in the mail and they will start receiving those in the next couple of weeks. So all of them will hopefully be out mid to late June and in the hands of our clients and, and recipients to uh, use over these next few weeks um, to support their families. Additionally, in this space, we did some administrative changes. Actually, in all three of our programs, child care, SNAP, and cash assistance, we extended recertification periods to ensure families didn't lose eligibility when they couldn't maybe leave their home because of a health reason. So I wanted to just make sure that you know that from the JFS perspective, our goal was to reduce administrative burden and to try and identify new resources for families to receive during this time. So through PEBT, the um, reduced administrative burden, and then also we um, increased all families to their maximum allotment, which may not sound like a big deal, but depending on income and expenses, families always don't uh, receive that maximum allotment. And through that work with our federal partners, we were able to bring in an additional $80 million in food benefits loaded to cards for more than 450,000 people for March, April, May, and June. And again, this doesn't solve the food security issue, but it certainly goes a, a long way in the right direction to ensure that these families are not solely dependent on our food banks at a time when they're also having um, you know, increased need and, and less resources. So wanted to provide those critical updates and just again, uh, wrap up by saying thank you to all of you for the work you do. We have families that depend on you. We certainly depend on you and just could not be more proud to be a part of the same team. So thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Kara. So again, jam-packed with so much information. Um, I have a couple follow-ups related to child care, but thank you for going you know, over the broad. We get a sense of the breadth of all the work that you do. Um, with um, you know, the changes to group size in child care has obviously been, been a huge impact. Um, do you, how do you foresee that like over time, do you see um, adding, a, you know, group size will sort of gradually increase? Are there milestones? Do you have benchmarks that are gonna help you make those decisions? Well, we're still working that out. Um, that has been a focused conversation in the last couple weeks. And obviously the um, uh, number one priority for us to kind of identify because we know programs really need to know what that looks like in the next few months. So we're tossing around a couple of different ideas. We'll definitely be using um, our, our teams again to kind of get some feedback, but I can't say for sure if it will be phased, or it will kind of be a um, roll back to where we were. I think okay. the approach has worked well in the past, but we know that that can also create confusion. So we really are just in the feedback mm -hmm. phase, but are focused on making quick decisions there. Okay. And as this is evolving and it's such a new world for families, what's going to be their best way um, if they're looking for child care? Uh, will, is the state updating their database? I know you're collecting so much data, but um, how are you going to handle all this data that you have and how should families proceed? Yep. So we have the child care search tool on our website. We are giving programs a little bit of time right now just to update their information because we don't want them to be open, not have told us, and then we take them off our list. So we're, we're doing that work um, now, and I would hope that we would have that updated by the end of June. So I would still say the child care search on ODGFS's website is a great tool. Obviously, that will give you contact information that you can then call those programs and see what availability they have. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. And then last but not least, um, the study that Ohio's doing, which is so important on the impact of COVID, um, any sense of when we'll get some early results? So we're hoping if we can get everything in line that we will have testing underway in the next few weeks and that we will have preliminary uh, findings mid to late July. Again, all of that hinges on ensuring agreements get put in place at the appropriate times, but people are moving mm -hmm. fast to get that done. Good. It's, everyone's committed. Yeah. Well, um, testing for the child care system has been something that we've talked a lot about in our community and been sort of advocating for that at the state level. You may have an email for me on that. So yeah. we're, we're excited to, um, first of all, see that testing um, in general in the state has really been opened up by the governor and we're really very supportive. Anything we can do in Cuyahoga County uh, to help you in that regard, um, er, and I should have said that to everybody, we're here, as you know, uh, as your colleagues uh, locally to support the work you do and help you. So, uh, but thank you for everything, um, all those updates and um, everything you've done uh, related to the programs under your purview as well. And um, I will just say a few closing words. So if you want to un unvideo, you're welcome to do that, Kara. And um, just to say to um, all of my state colleagues how much we appreciate um, these updates. And uh, again, reach out to all of our local partners who um, are there um, still providing the services that are so crucial to families at this time, even while um, our service providers themselves have been um, equally perhaps affected by all the events going on. And so it's been a huge uh, pivot, just doesn't seem to quite capture what we've all done um, at the state level and state government, as well as um, I will give a shout out to my county colleagues, county government, and then to all service providers and, um, and really everyone as we've adjusted to this new world. And we're all in this together, but I'll end by saying we're bending, we're not breaking, and that's the uh, resilience is key. And um, we just thank everybody um, for uh, being in this together. And I will uh, use our county motto, which is together we thrive. And um, I will end there. So thanks, everybody, and hope to see you in person next year.